Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. The wine industry has played a significant role in both the history of Missouri and the United States. In fact, the state was the number one wine producer in the country during the mid-1800s. And we have award-winning travel food and wine writer Corey Solomon back on our second Friday food wine travel show with the International Food Wine Travel Writers Association. And she's joining us to give us an insight into Missouri wines, uh, some of the history and the different varietals that come out of the region. And I encourage you to go to her website. It's written palette.com and also watch for her article coming up on blend radio and tv.com as well as in one of our fall or winter issues of big blend radio and tv uh, magazine so welcome back Corey. how are you doing i'm doing great it's fun to be back with uh you and nancy hey i know nancy and i we just drove through missouri uh, we, we left, uh, we were in uh, Springfield, Kentucky, in bourbon country in the central region, and did a big road trip all the way through, um, and all the way to Colorado, and we were going through, you know, all the different billboards of all the different wineries, and we were thinking of you, because uh, one of the wineries, we've actually had them on the show a few times, is Stonehill Winery, and right. uh, it's really interesting, because I remember them talking about how historic they are and um even having um i think they had one part of their vineyard uh, that didn't get totally torn down during the prohibition or something well if you were out in the outskirts they kind of missed some of those vineyards but you know every i do remember when i was last in herman that a lot there were some vines left it's not like in california where they left the vines uh there they confiscated mm. the more they much more than they did anywhere else. Wow. Oh. Wow. And so um, you've been, I was reading your article and everyone again, blend radio and TV.com. Actually it's up there now, actually uh, it's, it's going to be in the big blend radio and TV magazine, as I was saying, but it's there now um, reading your article. You, you were talking about um, that you've been back and forth there a number of times. So it's kind of, it's interesting because you're, you've done so much in California as well. You're based in LA, but I think, you know, we've talked about the Tri-Valley area with you, the, some of the historic wineries with you. Uh, so it's kind of interesting that you've gone back and forth to Missouri, but it seems that the two regions have kind of been on in a parallel in a way. Yes, they have. Um, it's, they both started, I think, pretty close to the same time uh, in the mid-1800s in Missouri. It's because German immigrants came in and saw the area being like, looking like the Rhine River Valley, and the soils were fertile, whereas in California, I think it was the gold rush that brought a lot, you know, you got to feed the the miners, not feed, let them drink something them after up. a long day of work. So, you know, it's it, the timing was kind of for different reasons, but, you know, pretty close timing. And the same with, you know, the revival or the rebirth of the wine industry in both states was about the same time in the 1960s, 1970s. Hmm. So, yeah, because we kicked prohibition out and we had to start all over again. And it takes a lot of time and money to open up a winery. It doesn't happen overnight. You just don't go plant a grape and hope you have a bottle of wine the next day. It takes a nope. lot. It is a couple of years. And although many of the wineries did remain intact, I mean, more so in California, if you made Sacramento wine, you were, there was no problem with, um, hmm. you, know, you just switched gears. Yeah. I wonder if, you know, cause California had all the missions if that helped them kind of save <laughs> some of their vineyards. Well, but a lot of the wineries themselves in California made made wines, uh, Sacramento wines. That was I think smart. the big ones like Wente and those, they did. Mm -hmm. um, that's how they survived. Yeah. I, and I bet everyone was going to church on Sunday. <laughs> they didn't have a problem. Well, you know, I just read an article, some, or yeah, I read somewhere that a lot of them went to growing uh what's called, uh, a variety called Alicante Boucher because you were allowed to make wine, you know, what they call bathtub wine at your ho home making wine. And it was because it was heavier skinned 
they could ship it. So they'd ship it from California to New York, and that was that was one of I can't say how well those wines were when they were made, but that's they would make they'd mm. use that grape for making wine at home. Hmm. Okay, so you could get away with that. That's that's the bathtub wine. That's funny. I have friends who make bathtub beer. And it's like, okay, you know, you're, you visit them. They're like, well, if you go in that bathroom, it may, you know, be a little different than the other one. <laughs> There's beer in there. <laughs> so I, I didn't know they were doing that with wine back in the day, but why not, you know? <laughs> During Prohibition, they did, yeah. Yeah, you have, you have to get that wine on. So how many times do you think you've been to Missouri now? How many times? Yeah. Well, for wine, it's been about, I think, four times. Okay. But if I've been many more times because I used to go for I've gone many several I have good friends mm-hmm. well, that lived in St. Louis, so mm-hmm. I'd go visit and go I'd fly my dogs out. Mm-hmm. So that's those were the first visits. I I must say I think I went three or four times before I even mm-hmm. decided to go into walk you know walk into a winery there. And mm-hmm. is the winery experience do does the food kind of pair up with the wine well you know in the region does the region embrace because i was reading what you said it's 136 wineries in missouri that's, that's a lot, lot. yes mm-hmm. um i think one of the my experience with food and wine pairing i haven't had a lot of that in missouri i mean i know one of the big restaurants in st louis annie gunn is a steakhouse that's very well known and they do a lot of wine pairing, but I'm not sure mm. it's Missouri wine. I think it's their wine list is quite extensive from mm. all over the world. Oh, I've, nice. I've only been to that restaurant once, but okay. um, I in those wine, a lot of it is those wine regions are based on which we don't have here in California are wine trails, and this is mm. very common both on the East Coast, the Midwest, are these wine trails to so the, the groups of wineries pair up and they you know in Herman they've got the they have the Herman trolley that can take you from winery to winery oh um and you know but they've got each area has these wine trails I forget how I don't have it in front of me but I don't there's quite I think there's 11 wine yeah, trails I'll read your article in Missouri. Now. it's right in front of me and it's 11 wine trails and five AVAs which is you know 136 wineries 11 wine trails and five AVAs that's pretty extensive yes and you'll find that a lot on the you know i've i've seen that in virginia and in many in in a lot of states they have these wine trails it's based and michigan has it um where they're based on these wine trails it's a little it's different than the concept we have Hmm. in california Hmm. And well, it's kind of nice, I, especially if you don't have to drive, right? You know, that's you can take limos and Ubers and everything now. But to have a trolley, I like that idea. You talk um, about, yeah, you talk about two different areas: Augusta and then Herman, right? Those are your two main areas. Those are my main. I've been to, I've tried wineries. Other, I, I've been to the Saint Genevieve area, hmm. but mainly Herman and Augusta. Um, my last trip which was last fall, I went to Augusta and I concentrated there. Um, but, you know, I've tasted wine from other regions there. I haven't been to all of them. Maybe one day I will. Yeah. Do, <laughs> do the regions differ in what they can, what kind of grapes they can grow and what wines they produce? Um, there, I think it's it may be based on the, you know, like any region, it's based on the soil. And as I explained between Herman and Augusta in my article, it's it's one side of the river has a certain type of soil and the other side has the more rocky mm. and more minerals. So that's a different, that's on the Herman side. So you're going to get different profiles of taste mm. in the wine. They may grow the same grapes, but it's going to change the profile. It's it's the same thing anywhere mm-hmm. in the world, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's going to be different regions. And then, so is it mostly the Norton? Because I remember Norton being um, the main Norton grape. Norton is their, is their state grape. 
and um, hmm. it's not but, mostly Norton. They do a lot. I mean, the big thing I noticed from when I first started going to Missouri and exploring wine was the palate of the people coming to the wineries was much more, uh, you know, sweet in oh. the Midwest. And I've noticed it's developing more and they're making more dry wines. They're getting, I've seen an evolution in the Norton and also in Chamberson. When I first tasted them in 2012, I found them very austere and I wasn't really thrilled with them. I did better on the whites and the rosés. But I think sure. now the the wines that I've tasted are much, much different than what I tasted the in the, hmm. And I can say that from the various different wineries that I went to. Hmm. You 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 listed varietals that I think Nancy and I are new for us. Um, but you said Chamberson. Is that how do you pronounce that? Am I getting that? Chamberson. 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 Huh. So okay. So our in Catawba. Kat, I mean, these are. I want to drink well, that Catawba. Do this, to That's when you see in the <laughs> south and up north. It's a lot of it's due to the weather, okay. you know. So they can't grow um, the same varieties we do. So many of their varieties are high, what are called hybrids. They're, I, I'm, they're, you know, a mixture. You know, okay. I'll use Char Chardonnay as a mixture of Chardonnay and Saval Blanc. Okay. Um, and Saval so, Blanc is more French, right? Saval Blanc is French. It's just, as I, I described it as Chenin Blanc means Sauvignon Blanc and mm -hmm. Pinot Grigio. So maybe it's a combination of Italian and French. Mm. Oh, when, this is interesting. Go ahead, Nancy. I was just going to say, when you say it's a combination, are you saying they're using different grapes or are they, what are, what's the difference? What are they actually doing that's different? That make, well, makes well they will use different grapes and bring them okay. together okay. um that's a lot of how many of the new blend you know when people mm -hmm. it's done all the time where you know you you create a um variety it's a blend it's a mixture of one grape with another and it becomes mm -hmm. a new grape okay. um cool but what's interesting is missouri is they've got a lot of their um, hybrids are, like you said, the French, and we said French and Italian, but they also have a, several German coming mm -hmm. down from German descent in the, in the um, hybrid. And that okay. would be like Traminette or, um, well, Traminette's the most apparent one. Hmm. And, re and you, what about Rieslings and things like that? And I didn't see any, I've not tried a Riesling there. I usually in those areas, they are using some of the grapes um, that mm -hmm. we use, we have here, they use them as blending grapes and it's hard to grow the weather, you know, the, mm -hmm. you have, and a lot of times what ends up is because they have bad weather, really cold winters. Um, they have to pull up the vines if they have, Chardonnay or one winery I know used Syrah mm. and he blended with Syrah. I actually liked that wine and a lot and it gave it more of a little continental influence, but um, it, they're very hard to grow there. <laughs> How interesting. How interesting. And then the, you, you also mentioned that um, some of the vintners are using some of the grapes that are like native, like Native Americans were growing. And so they're adding well, that's that. that's the Norton. Norton okay. is a native grape. Huh. Um, I didn't know that. Cool. Yep. It's not, it's not for your computer. Though your computer may want some <laughs> Norton wine. It Norton needs wine. it. <laughs> virus, I don't even know. It cries for it every day. I know. I know. So <laughs> Well, you know, Norton was um, Thomas Jefferson in Virginia. That's Norton. They do a lot of Norton in Virginia also. Oh, so mm. you know, when you say it's a state grape, I didn't even know that states had a, their own grape. That's interesting. Well, Is that state, yes. If huh. you, not every state has a state grape. They should that, get on it. No. They need to get on it because, come on, that's fun. I mean, it's, so, it's a thing. So if you have a grape, a Norton grape, and it's, 
in one state and you have a Norton grape from another state, um, would those two grapes taste different? Probably, most likely, yes. Yeah, because of the reasons. soil. Because the one, the, yeah. the soil, the climate, although mm -hmm. Virginia, you know, it's, they, I, I will say they have certain commonalities in climate, but you, the terrain, the soil, mm -hmm. um, the other thing is the winemaker and mm -hmm. how they, you know, that influence mm -hmm. will influence, it will influence any variety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I thought, just in general, you know, it's kind of like when you make a cake and you get your ingredients from places you expect the ingredients to all be exactly the same, no matter where you get them from. But then when you get to produce, that really doesn't work that way. Hmm. Yeah, it is a little different. It, Corey, when you were there, did you, um, you were talking about the different wineries and how they were on trails, but are the wineries, like when you go there, are they different, a different atmosphere than like when you look at California? I'm just kind of using these two as a parallel line. You know, I remember when we talked to Stonehill, that this had got to be like 10 years ago that they were, when we were first starting our shows. And some of the images, I remember it looked like they were almost like in a castle. Uh, so what's it like actually going into the wineries? Are, you know, I know some wineries are a little smaller version, you know, smaller or not. Um, but what, what are the wineries like? They're, they're very different. And it depends, it really gets down to, you know, Stonehill, isn't one of the oldest wineries and it's it's more i'm going to use the word monumental because it's a bigger winery that the structure is a brook structure that's bigger um but so i would say that is one of the larger properties that i i saw there um but then you get to another one that was started in the eight very close time as uh stonehill which is adam Patuka. I hope I said that right. Sometimes mm -hmm. I don't. Um, and that one is very countrified. It's like an, it's totally the opposite feeling. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's, it's very rustic. It's, it's much different. And then you've got Hermanoff, which is another brick building, but it, it's, it's, a, it's, I would say it's closer, but the buildings, the stature of the building isn't quite as great, but it's got you know, it's got some interest. They all have, not all of them, but most of them have caves and they're interesting to see. Cool. And the caves at Hermanoff are very different from the caves at Stonehill. Hmm. I would say the cave that I saw at Stone, Stonehill was very similar to the one in Augusta that I saw at the oldest winery there, which is Mount Pleasant. Hmm. So it had sort of the same feel. It's interesting because you called it as the, this winery or campus. I've never heard of a winery as a campus. Sounds like well, they described it. The owner described it as the campus <laughs> because they do have learning centers and oh. I. Uh, I'll I've got to send you that picture and you'll see why he, it does it. I hadn't sent it yet, so. Mm. Oh, very cool, very cool. So they also uh, you mentioned Tawny Port, and that's something you know. Port is, mm. you know, that's like. Oh. That's special juice, honestly. You can't get that, you know, that there's certain places who really do a good port. And um, I remember actually having port at Stonehill, from Stonehill um, uh, being good. And also a Messina Hoff Winery in Texas doing a really good port. Um, but what you said the Tawny Port there at Mount Pleasant was something that people really need to try. Yes, that one I really liked. I I found it very good. I tried their reg, their other their port also, but the one that hit me on my visit was the Tawny Port. Hmm. How interesting. How interesting. And then okay, so then when you go to the wineries you're saying they're all different, but you also talked about food in the region. So apparently, you know, with the German influence there, you've got sausage and bratwurst, right? And um Right. You also said cheese this is a cheese place and jersey cows they have jersey cows there well this is a funny story is one of the times i went to visit and in fact when we also did this cheese sampling when i did a seminar here in la that the cheese maker sent it to us and um i think these jersey cows 
come mm. down from the cows that the um, Queen Victoria gave to the Vanderbilts. Mm. So there's a, a history, and you know, it was interesting. My it, trying the cheeses at the winery the first time, and they they were really good. And how cheese is made, I wasn't aware at that time that you know, gra- the type of grass determines the cheese. Mm-hmm or the time of year determines the cheese. Um, I was not aware of that at all. And um, I found it very interesting, this cool cow cheese, which is really fantastic. And in fact, he at the, the last time I tried it, not the recently, he tried, he incorporated, I think it was an Edom, or it was a Gouda. Mm. He put some Norton in it. So he combined oh. it, and that was really good. Oh, 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 oh! I, I, yeah. you know, now I'm hungry, and I'm, I'm getting thirsty. I know. <laughs> when you yeah. said eat them, and you know, you know, growing up in South Africa, the wine and the cheese thing, just you know, they'd make these amazing Gouda and Eden, Eden cheeses, and oh man, you just, and then you've got the wine, and you've got like this beautiful setting, and it, it sounds like it out there. Uh, the other thing, you've got all this great food, you've got this great wine, and we were talking about the soil and the weather can change things. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know if it, you know, we were dr- just driving through going from Kentucky to Colorado, and we had been in Kentucky and Arkansas and um, Louisiana and East Texas for about three weeks. And all I know is we were melting, right? And um, but we did find really good wine, by the way. Oh, my gosh. We found some good wine in, in Nacogdoches. Um, they made a really good Tempranillo. But it was so humid there. And I was wondering, like, is Missouri humid? Because we, we we really did a drive-by. We saw the arches, the gold, the, the, you know, the, the St. Louis <laughs> arches out there. And yep. I'm like, hi to the arches. We're driving by. And I'm like, this totally sucks. I want to pull over. Uh, but it was a long driveway to keep going. Um, is it humid there? And does that affect yes grapes ooh, because i always wonder about humidity and in, in making wine um i think it's fine i mean you've got wineries you know the whole east coast is human and yeah humid not human uh <laughs> and they um they make a lot of wine so I, I think it it's fine i mean one thing you do have in missouri in the summer is a lot of mosquitoes mm-hmm. so the humidity brings out the mosquitoes yeah. So yeah, if you're going during the summer, you got to come prepared um, for mosquito protection. Yep. I still have mosquito bites on my butt. <laughs> I, no I, we seem to meet them everywhere. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they just seem to be one of the most um, prolific and can take anything insects ever. Yeah. They're they're the birds of the south. The they're birds of the northeast. <laughs> <laughs> They're birds. That's what we call them. But so when people go to these areas, what about where you were saying, mentioning bed and breakfast seem to be a place, uh, kind of place for people to stay? Yes, they don't. Um, in those, in some of the small towns, it's they're very quaint. They're, I would recommend a bed and breakfast. Or I stayed when I stayed in Herman. I stayed at the. Um, let me. Get its exact oh, name. Is it the, the Hermanoff? Yeah, the Inn at Herm- yeah, the Inn at Hermanoff. Yes, and they have a main building, and then they also have like cottages. And I stayed up in a cottage because nice. that they had one room that they would allow a dog in. Cool. And I because I had my dog with me at the time, and um, they're they're very charming. And in in Herman. The owner of Herman, uh, Hermanoff is Jim Der, Deerberg, and mm-hmm. there are two brothers. One is in, and I always confuse them, one's in the banking and one's in groceries. Back, east, back in the Midwest, Deerberg markets are very big. And he is very well known in Herman because he, he really helped get the, help restore the town. And when I was in Herman, uh, Jim Deerberg gave me a tour. Mm. Um, of of Herman, and you could really see his love for and collecting the old antiques for these old houses that, you know, really trying to restore it. And I'm sure if I went back now, a lot of it's been restored because mm. that, that first trip was in 2012 when he gave me the tour. 
and so part of his besides his winery he has he ha- has that in hmm. and so nice. and the and winery- some of us in, out in California know him because of Deerberg Star Lane Winery because okay. that's his California winery and and so the Hermanoff Winery his winery was originally a brewery right it was a winery and brewery and actually these cottages that you stay in they were originally little wine distil- houses and distilleries that they restored. Oh, neat. The whole area was filled with little wineries and distilleries. And Wow. And it's on the Register of Historic Places, which that's always cool to have that status and to keep that history, you know. It's amazing because yeah. you look back, I mean, these are from the 1800s, you know. I, I dig that. I think that's, you know, amazing. And then you were talking about Adam Pukta. Pukta? Uh, uh-oh. Uh, the oldest family-run. Pukta. Pukta. Okay. <laughs> uh, is the oldest family-run winery uh, in the state, which is really nice. And you're not only ports over there, they do sherry. Now, I know that you're you're playing around in Santa Fe soon. Um, and yep. I, I don't know if you guys will get to the end of Governors, but they have – sherry and cookie hour and they have a steak cookie in new mexico that i will not try to pronounce um but you can go in and they serve these amazing different sherries so you can have this whole tasting experience with the new mexico cookie so when you get to santa fe i just highly recommend that because <laughs> you know when, where do you when do you get to have sherry at four o'clock in the southwest with not cookie? not often i know i know so sherry i mean this is i i here you are with a winery in, in Missouri that makes sherry, and you barely hear about that. So um, that's really neat to find out about and get some sherry. I love sherry. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's a South it's, African habit. Yeah, <laughs> they did that a lot there. And, well, it makes that t- or you, um, you got to go back to Portugal. Yeah. That's big in, in the southern part of Portugal. And Spain, yeah. It's a very European way to enjoy your afternoon. I should, you know, <laughs> makes everybody happy, you know. Very civilized. Some people have martini lunches. Everybody has, there's, you know, a bunch of us who have, like, sherry at, at, you know, in the afternoon. It's it's a nice way to keep everybody smiling and, and all that good stuff. Um, and I want to give out the websites for, you know, the wine region. So you're saying MissouriWine.org. That's, you know, for all of the whole region, the whole all the state wineries. And then there's that wine trail. The Herman wine trail is HermanWineTrail.com. That's so Herman is with two N's, right? Yes. Get that straight. Everybody, Herman is with two N's. And um, and then visit Herman.com with two N's. And then if you're going to Augusta, Augusta, go to Augusta-Chamber.org. And, of course, everything's in the article as well on BlendRadio and TV.com. But, you know, before you go, I, I wanted to touch base because I know you're going to Santa Fe. Are you, You're going to go to the International Food Wine Travel Writers Association Conference, right, in November? Are you in the yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. This is kind of this trip that I'm going leaving Sunday is kind. Of, it's a combination. It's a preview for of uh, because I'm going with Andy Harris, who's our hmm. culinary specialist, who's putting together the culinary panel. Um, he's checking out some. Of, we're checking out some of the restaurants, things to do. We're going to kind of give, get a highlight beforehand. But I'm also going to do some pet-friendly hotel articles, so mm-hmm. I'll have a dog in tow with us. Nice, so. nice. Well, the plaza is really a fun place, you know, to take. And they've got that wonderful river walk as well um, on the Santa Fe Trail that you can go and take. You know, really nice place to walk. Dogs, nice and shaded and green and grassy, which is nice because that's the thing about when you're traveling with pets. I always think it's important to find places that dogs can actually walk. That's not on on hot cement or hot right. asphalt that they have to have like a nice grassy area Don't you well think? that's one of the reasons i like the la posada is the grounds are really nice to walk the dog mm-hmm. oh cool cool um talking about if toi i know you're the membership chair this year so you yes. get to go and say come on come be a member <laughs> how long have you been a member of if toi i joined in 2013 yeah yeah it's been a and, while then yeah so i just you know, it's been, it's, it's fun bringing new people in and trying to get, um, really trying hard to get new uh, associate members so that we can, you know, the members can take advantage of the different 
locations that these associate members are from, um, mm -hmm. you know. The different destinations. The different that destinations, say? CDBs, yeah. PR. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's kind of mm -hmm. one of my goals is to bring more of the, those type of people in. In fact, right now we're offering a um, incentive that if you join IFTWA, um, your second year you get $40 off the membership fee. So, so we're hey. trying to really boost up membership and yeah. well, get more that's, people to get involved. I think that's what's nice about IFTWA, the International Food, Wine, Travel Rides Association. Everyone, the website is ifwtwa.org is that it's, you know, normally there's, here's the writers association. It's all the writers on their own. Uh, oh no, if you're a photographer, no, no. But you, <laughs> with IFTWA, you can be a photographer, you can be a, a cookbook author, you could be in the wine industry, you could be a chef, you could be the destination. I like that it puts everyone together so that there's that real connectivity. Because why have, you know, why, why limit? You know, people want to connect and that's the whole point so that, people know about these destinations, like what you're talking about with Missouri and the, and the different wineries and the wine trails, you know, that's important to get it out to everybody so people know where to go and where to find good wine. That's really important, where to find good wine and sherry and port. <laughs> so I think that's great about and it. And food and travel and yeah. all, all of the above. <laughs> yeah, we got to have fun in life, darn it. <laughs> so it's good that you, you're looking at everyone coming together that way. Um, I think well, you know, I read one of the profiles of one of the new members, and in fact, it's going to be, and I, she said, I want to create memories, not dreams. Mm. And travel is a memory. Mm. And, or wine tasting is too, because wine tasting is so social. You remember the people you had a certain wine with. So uh, it, they do make memories rather than mm. just a dream. <laughs> <laughs> it's about it, having those experience. It's an experience. In, you know, yeah. memories come from an experience. You have to have that experience. And uh, there's nothing better than getting out. You know, get out of your house. <laughs> Go somewhere new and experience that. So everyone, uh, the International Food, Wine, Travel Writers Association, again, their conference is in November in beautiful, historic Santa Fe, New Mexico, our oldest capital city in the country. Um, talk about food and margaritas. There's a margarita trail there. So Missouri has the wine trails and Santa Fe has a margarita trail, which is good. And the entire state of New Mexico has a beer trail. So that's good, too. Uh, they so, have a wine trail, too. Oh, no, don't leave out the wine. <laughs> I know. Come on, no. California. You got to get on with it. <laughs> you gotta, you need, we need trails and trolleys that take you around. I like that. I want to be, you know, be chauffeured around when it's wine time. I don't want to have to think. You know, you want to just... Well, you don't want to... And you don't want to drink and drive. No, no, you don't want that. That's not a good thing at all. Not at all. Uh-uh. No, it, it's important that it's, you know, safe, you know, have a good time and don't drive. So um, everyone, again, MissouriWine.org is a website to go to. And for the Food Wine Travel Writers Association, it's IFWTWA.org. And you can keep up with Corey and her adventures wherever she's roaming around the world, across the country, or with her dogs or without. You can go to writtenpalette.com. She's on Twitter at Corey Solomon. She's also on Facebook under Written Palette. And on, you're on Instagram too, right? I see you on Instagram. Yes, I'm Corey Solomon. I'm on Instagram as. Okay, good. So everyone can keep up with her. There, you there. And um, also, don't forget her article is up on Blend Radio and TV.com. If you just type in Corey, C O R I, uh, Corey, you'll find her other articles and interviews with us on Idaho and the Tri Valley region of California as well, Idaho wines. And now you'll find Missouri. So you'll be able to keep up with her on all these wine destinations. And her article will also be in an upcoming issue of Big Blend Radio and TV magazine. Uh, Corey, we always appreciate you having on the show show and uh, joining us and teaching us about these destinations and um, I'm sure I've played this song for you but in, and if I have I have to play it again because you know you are wine headed so we're going to play the song wine headed I'm <laughs> just saying because you know this is three wine destinations so we get to have the the song wine headed from Johnny Mastro and the Mama's Boys out of New Orleans uh, and uh, keep up with them at johnnymastro.com so thank you so much for joining us Thank you. When you see your baby, no 
stand in the street Begging out for nickel man Everyone she meet Little girl used to be her Nice and fine Shot at the title got Knocked out by wine She's wine headed She's wine headed And my wine headed woman Right on the promised land Well if there's wine in heaven She's gonna tell you where it's at She gonna roll around and Fake it fat Then when the devil reaches up His big hand She gonna Yeah. <laughs>